In this video, we're going to take a look at the early days of Compact Disc. Behind me are two early CD players, one from Philips and one from Sony, the two companies responsible for the creation of the Compact Disc format, as well as some discs that were made in the early 80s that might just look a little bit different to what you're used to seeing if you look at a CD made more recently. We're going to open both players up and see how each manufacturer managed to make a compact disc player. They're both very different inside. We're going to do some cosmetic repairs on the Sony, and we're also going to have a look at what you got in the box with the Philips player when you opened it brand new all the way back in 1983. My name's Elise, and I'm the General Purpose Nerd. This is a Sony CDP-11S, uh, it was released in 1985, it's actually a cut down version of the CDP-101, Sony's first consumer player. Let's take a look inside. We've got two screws either side to remove, so it's pretty straightforward to get into. Now when I say that this is a cut down version of Sony's first consumer player, it misses out on the remote control and uh, you also can't program track playback sequence in this so if you were say recording a cassette or something and you wanted to specify uh, a playback order like program a playback order uh, you can't do that with this player it's actually fairly simple uh, so yeah and also it doesn't have a remote control so if you wanted to change tracks you had to physically walk up to the machine as you can see the lid's not really in the best condition it's a bit rusty and the chrome on the front around the play and pause buttons is flaking off so but we'll address those a bit later on so now we're inside, you can see we've got a uh, really heavy duty metal tray mechanism on the left. Um, and if we take out these two screws that retain the board on the right hand side, it's actually really neat. It uh, swings up into what Sony refers to in the manual as the service position. And uh, you can actually, you know, it's very easy to adjust this player when it's running. And I mean, as we've seen, it's quite easy to get into as well. Looking at it from this angle, you've got a nice view of uh, the inside of the board. You can see the trimmer pots there that are used for adjusting the settings on the CD player itself. That uh, heatsink there is on the servo amplifier IC, and this one down here is on the RAM control chip. And both of these run really hot straight out of the factory, so putting an extra heat sinking on these actually makes these players last quite a bit longer. Here are some detail shots of the uh, circuit boards. This is the top one. This is the bottom one. You can see those really nice Alna electrolytic capacitors, the maroon ones there. So if we turn the player on, you can see that we get a zero in the display there. Indicates that the player is waiting for a disc. A real neat feature about this player is if we open the tray, you can see that the disc clamping mechanism here is actually powered by its own motor. It's not integral to the tray mechanism like it was on some later players. They usually had a roller or something and that clamper was just held down with a spring. But in this player, it has its own motor. And we can see if we take a close up, it's a real nice smooth action. You know, it goes up and down, clamps the disc really securely. And we've got that little optical sensor there to detect whether there's a disc in place. Now the laser mechanism here actually moves backwards and forwards in a linear fashion. It's that uh, big silver part in the center with the word Sony on it. Really solid, very well engineered, and that's probably why it's still working nearly 35 years after this player was produced. Now we're gonna repair the damaged chrome. To take off the front panel, we've got three screws to remove here. And then another three screws to take off on the underside of the unit. Now we've got the front panel unscrewed, we can undo the PCB and the headphone PCB and also take off the control buttons.
Oops, I missed a screw. Don't you hate when that happens? And with that, the PCB is free. So we'll take out this little ground lead. Take out the headphone board. And now we can take out all the control buttons. They're in this neat assembly, all held together. And they pivot on this large metal bar that's uh, held at the top, which is actually makes a really solid feeling controls. And then the open close button is on by itself. On this PCB, we've got the vacuum fluorescent display and the play and the pause LEDs, as well as all the tack switches that control the actual player. Now we've separated everything, you can see this chrome is in really poor shape. Just running my finger over it's enough to make it flake off, and it really lets down the appearance of this unit. Now we need to take these pieces out. I'm going to do this off camera because I'm going to need to use a knife and it's going to be a little bit hard to film. Okay, so now we've got these pieces out, you can see the chrome is looking pretty ropey. In fact, it's just flaking off. But that's okay, I've got a cunning plan to fix it. I figured that I could fix this very easily with some chrome vinyl. So I'm just gonna cut a piece to size, to fit each of these pieces and we'll apply it, trim it up and put it back together and see how it looks. Okay, so now we're trimming off the excess chrome and it's a little bit hard to see because my hands are in the way, but I'm using a brand new razor blade and it's making some nice clean cuts. All done. While I've got this face blade off, I'm gonna give it a good clean. This is a bit dusty. All right, time to put these pieces back in. The easiest way is to just uh, hold them in with a little dot of super glue gel. That's the larger piece in. And now we'll do the same with the smaller piece. A few dots of super glue, and that'll hold it in properly. And that does not look too bad. No more rust, no more flaking chrome. Guess we better deal with the uh, rest of the damage on the front of the player. All these little wear spots. I've just got some silver paint on a cotton swab. I'm just going to gently tap it in, bit by bit, and fill in all those marks. And we'll do the other side as well. And all done. And it doesn't look bad. Now what about the lid? Ah yes, I gave this a bit of a sand and three coats of some nice silver spray paint and it's come up rather well. I 
much, much better. All that's left to do now is to uh, turn on the player, pop in a disc and listen to some music. And with that, the CDP11S is now finished. Doesn't it look great? Plays perfectly, looks really nice. It's not quite perfect appearance wise, but this player's had a hard life and I've made it look a lot better than it did, so I consider that a success. Now let's take a look at the Philips player. This is a CD202 made in late 1983. The first thing you'll notice that's different to the Sony is the fact that it's a top loader. It doesn't have a tray mechanism, it's just got this flip up door. Another difference is that the laser actually moves in an arc here, it doesn't go in a straight line, and uh, it swings using an electromagnet. Now let's take a look inside. You remember, it only took four screws to get the Sony open, but the Philips is a little different. Oh, and I'm gonna need a Torx bit. What an effort that was. So inside the Philips, we have an MAB8410 microcontroller, two TDA1540 DACs, an SAA7030, 20 and 10 set of control chips, and an 8K static RAM. Now the interboard connections in this Philips are really interesting because they're just like individual connectors with like a plastic backplane. And this player was never terribly reliable even when it was new, and this one doesn't work. That microcontroller I pointed out first unfortunately has failed. Now let's take a look at what you got in the box with the Philips player when it was brand new. And it's more than just an owner's manual. This incredible folio opens up to reveal a demonstration disc which we'll have a look at later. But you've also got an owner's manual in the front, in multiple languages. And then you've got these really awesome 80s style brochures, one on lasers and one on digital technology. Then over the page we've got this membership to the Philips Compact Disc Club. Now, these forms were basically for all over continental Europe and even outside Europe, and they asked some really interesting questions like how many discs did you buy with your player and what hi-fi equipment do you have when you bought your CD player and things like that. Now in the back here is an addendum to the manual. And these players were, uh, they were made with running changes. So they had to update the manual even after they'd produced them is rather nifty. So yeah, we've got this extra page that's separate. Now going back to these brochures, we'll take a look at the digital one first. And I mean, this thing just screams 1980s. So as we go through, we've got an LCD watch, some interesting little comics, and it describes the difference between analog signals and digital signals and how they get from one to another within a CD player, which is actually really quite neat. It also touches on how the discs themselves are made. And uh, if you have a look on the back, you can actually see an early Philips computer there. Now this brochure is all about laser technology. It's a bit hard to get out. And this actually shows you uh, cutaway diagram of the laser used inside the Philips CD202 and the other early Philips players which is really quite neat. And then you've got that uh, laser coming from the moon to the earth so I'm guessing the graphic designer was a Star Wars fan. This also shows you a bit about fiber optic technology and um, yeah it's it's very interesting reading um, but you can see there on the left is the mechanism that the Philips uses and you can see that arc shaped guide that the laser moves on. And then on the back inside cover here, we've actually got a laser disc as well. So yeah, very, very 80s. And then here's the owner's manual. 
Mine's looking a little dog-eared, but it's still in pretty good condition considering its age. You can see we've got a nice yellow class 1 ye laser product sticker there on the left hand side. And there's some really nice pictograms in here that explain how to unpack and set up the player and how to connect it, you know, to make sure it's plugged into an auxiliary port and not into a phono port so you don't overload your amplifier. It's got a full set of specs and it's in quite a few different languages. So yeah, if you want to take a look at those, just pause and you can have a, have a look at them. Now over on this side, we've got space for the transport screws for the player and for what Philips calls a disc duster, which is actually a cleaning cloth for cleaning your CDs. Then they also included this demonstration disc. Now I should come clean, mine's not actually original. I printed out this album artwork just for this video. But you can see it's got a really interesting selection of music which I'm guessing has come from Philips Library because they had a pretty serious record catalogue at that stage as well. There's some Elton John and some Dire Straits and a few other real popular songs of the time. But there's also some classic and orchestral stuff. But yeah, that's what you got in the box when you unpack this play and you... And now we're going to take a look at some early discs. We've got three discs in front of us here. We've got Donald Fagan's The Nightfly, Yellow's Flag, and Lily Allen's It's Not Me, It's You. Now after doing a bit of research, I've discovered that this Donald Fagan album was the earliest disc in my collection, and the Lily Allen disc is the latest. So let's compare the two, shall we? So if you open both of these up, there is one thing they have in common. In fact, one thing common to all three of these discs, and that's that the album artwork is printed all the way through to the centre of the disc, on all of them. Now on other discs you may have seen, the album artwork only goes as far as the centre hub, which is clear in the middle. Now all three of these have their artwork all the way through, but there's one key difference. If you take a look at the two earlier discs, you can see that the silver coating all the way through to the centre hole whereas the Lily Allen disc is actually clear and just has the album artwork over the top of the hub. Now these two discs were actually pressed in Philips Polygram plant in West Germany in the early 80s, the Donald Fagan disc in 1984 and the yellow disc in 1987. And if we take a look at this disc, you can actually see here down here, it says made in West Germany by Polygram. And if we have a look at the yellow disc, you can see it's the same, made in W Germany along the bottom there. Now, this Donald Fagan disc in particular is what's called a target disc. And the reason they called it a target disc is because of this album artwork. And it looks like a target. Now, there were different variations of this art or different colour schemes that Polygram put on these CDs based on the record label that was getting them to produce the discs. So yeah, just a brief look at some older CDs. And uh, yeah, one way to look for an older pressing is to look for album art that goes all the way to the centre and is silvered all the way through, just like this. Then you know it's a fairly early disc. And with that, we've come to the end of my first YouTube video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please click like, subscribe, and if you really enjoyed it and like me to make more, Hop on over to my Patreon site where you can contribute and help support this channel. Thanks for watching.